Amen. Great singing. You may be seated. All right, take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 7. Psalm 7. I don't know that we'll make our way all the way through the Psalms. I'm just going to do it as the Lord leads, but I was praying about it, and I said, Lord, you know how easily distracted I get. I'm just amazed I made it to Psalm 7 so far. So... <laughs> <clears throat> but Psalm 7 is an interesting psalm, and the, one of the reasons I love going through the psalms, and it's so good for us uh, to be familiar with the psalms. Uh, when you're going through a time of discouragement, or maybe you just need kind of like a, a spiritual boost in the arm to kind of get you through the rest of the week or maybe through a day, it's always good to get into the Psalms because they're so encouraging. Sometimes they don't start off very encouraging, but they always finish that way. Uh, there are some tremendous, tremendous things you can find there. And Psalm 7 is an interesting psalm. We're going to start reading here in verse 1, and we're just going to kind of go through and uh, take it uh, a piece at a time and break it off into sections here. But it says, starts off, O oh Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it, rending it in pieces while there is none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy. Let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay mine honor in the dust. See law. We'll stop right there and we'll pray. Father, we thank you so much for the scriptures. I thank you that the word of God is powerful. And Lord, it is alive. And I don't know uh, what each person here is going through tonight. I know there's many, many needs. Uh, Lord, we could be going through some emotional trials. We, we could be going through some physical trials. Could be financial. Could be uh, anything. Could be just something mentally that we're going through. And we're fighting this battle. Uh, but Lord, we need your help. We need your encouragement. And I pray that, Lord, you might lift us up and help us, Lord, to, to be just like the saints of old, that we realize we are pilgrims, Lord, in this land, that we are uh, strangers, that we're not here. This is not our home, that we are just traveling through. And, Lord, that we need to be looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. And, Father, I pray that you help us to keep our eyes fixed on the prize, but Lord, help us also to realize that you've left us in this world, that we can be a light into this world, and we can be used to help bring other people to Jesus Christ. And Father, we just pray your blessings on us now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Well, if you look here, I don't know if your Bible has titles at the top. Mine does. And uh, this one here says, Shigeon of David, which he sang unto the Lord concerning the words of Chris the Benjamite. Now, we don't really know what that uh, Shigeon is, and some people think it was like a psalm, uh, it's kind of like a psalm broken up in sections. We don't know for sure, though. But he sang this song unto the Lord, and it was about what this individual, Cush, the Benjamite, was saying about him and saying to him. And we don't know who this, this man is, Cush the Benjamite. But we do know this, because he was a Benjamite, he was of the family of Saul. And, of course, Saul and his family, uh, we don't, a lot of them did not like David. Some of them were cursing David when he was leaving Israel, uh, whenever Absalom was, uh, you know, kind of rose up in rebellion. It was the Benjamites who were cursing them. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, strife there between the Benjamites and David's people. If you trade your Bibles, hold your place here. Turn back with me to 1 Samuel 22. 1 Samuel 22. And this is during Saul's reign when he was pursuing David. And it could very well be that this was around the time. It could be after even Saul had reigned and David now had been on the throne for a period of time that this song was written. We don't know for sure. But 1 Samuel 22, look at verse 7 if you would. And again, this is where he was pursuing David. 
It says, Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Hear now ye Benjamites. Most of his servants were from his own family. And it was cousins and relatives and uncles. And, and that's what you did. You promoted those within your own family and you helped them get along. And uh, that was not an uncommon thing. It says, Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? And we don't know if this was the problem, but when David took the throne and when he came to power, uh, maybe there were some Benjamites who were jealous of what all was going on because they weren't chosen like they were back when Saul was king. Uh, David chose a lot of his own family. He chose a lot of the tribe of Judah and other individuals to serve around him. But he writes this song here, and as he's writing this song, this man, this man by the name of Cush, is cursing him. He's, he's saying some things about him, we, and obviously uh, David thinks they're not true. Uh, we can see that as we go through the song. And, but David is writing this particular song. Now, if we go through this whole song, and we will here in just a second, what you're going to see and what I want you to notice, and this is important for us, there are no grumblings or complainings in this whole song. Here David is being cast down by what somebody else is saying. And I know that you know we live in a small community and oftentimes people are worried about what somebody else is thinking about it. And you know what? They're the ones with the problem. People who know you, they know your reputation, they know your character. Those are the people you can depend on. Right. Now, if you can't depend on them, might be something with your character. So you might want to get that fixed. But if your character is consistent and you are faithful and dependable, who cares what other people who don't know you so well, who cares what they think? Eventually they'll find out the facts. And that's kind of where David's coming at. There's no grumblings or complaining, but what he is pleading for throughout this psalm is he's pleading for justice. He just wants justice to be done. And that's really what we all would like, is just justice to be done. But here David is writing this song about his own life. So the title of my message here is, What Will the Words of Your Song Be? If you were writing your own song right now, what would it be? I think sometimes our song would sound like one of those old country songs. <laughs> You just lose everything, and it's all depressing, and it's discouraging. Sometimes that's the way it is. If we're honest with ourselves, we get that way. But would your song encourage other people who are going through difficult times? That is what we find here with David's song that he wrote. And, of course, all of the psalms, all 150 of the psalms, are the hymn book of Israel. They're the song book of Israel. So if we were writing a song about our life, would it sound like this song? So let's go through this song and just kind of see. We're going to look at five different sections of this song here. The first one we see is in verse 1 and 2. David is praying for deliverance. In verse 1 and 2, he's praying for deliverance. He says, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rend me in pieces, while there is none to deliver now, David is talking here about persecution that is attacking his soul. And what is the soul? We are made up of a trichotomy. That means three parts. We are made up of body, we're made up of soul, and we are made up of spirit. Our spirit is actually, when we get saved, our spirit, we talk about going soul winning, but really it's spirit winning. Our spirit is what is dead in trespasses and sins, and then it's quickened, and made alive through Jesus Christ, through faith in Christ. That's what the gospel does. But we all have a soul, and our soul is really who we are. It's not what you see in the mirror. That's just what other people see about you. But your soul is who you are. That is your mind. That is your will, your emotions. That is your person. And David here is being persecuted, and he's being attacked in his soul. Now, the battleground for the Christian is always right here. It's the thought life. That's where the devil is going to attack you more times than anything else. He's going to try to get your thinking to be wrong 
Whether it's wrong about other people or it's wrong about God or it's wrong about yourself, he wants your thinking to be wrong because guess what happens? If he can control your thinking, guess what's going to happen to your actions? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're thinking wrong, your actions are going to be wrong. And that's what he wants. So if our thinking is right, our actions will be right. We will respond in a Christ-like way. And that's the battleground for the Christian. So he's being attacked in his mind. He's being attacked in his will. This is... Uh, where this affects his decisions. If you are being attacked in your mind and you're being overcome by the devil, uh, you're yielding yourself to wrong thoughts, you're not bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, uh, your emotions, maybe you're just depressed and discouraged and it continues on this downward spiral. And uh, you know, like Doug was saying there as we were talking about prayer, sometimes even people when they're going, uh, going through physical difficulties or having physical uh Challenges and trials in your life, boy, I tell you what, you need to keep your mind right because that will be a big, uh, a go a long way in helping heal you. But if your thinking gets going down the wrong direction, it's going to be just like a cancer in the body. It's going to make things a lot worse. And because all of our emotions, our mind, our body, all of it is tied together and one affects the other. So it affects his decisions. And also, it affects his emotions. All of these things are tied into his soul. He's being attacked here. Well, we're being attacked today as well. Take your Bibles. I want you to, we'll be back here in the Psalms. I, I want to spend a little bit of time on this one point, and then the other ones will go quickly here. But turn to Matthew chapter 5, because I want you to see all of God's Word applies to our day and time today. You know, sometimes, I remember years ago before I got into church, I thought, well, the Bible doesn't apply to me. It was written 2,000 years ago. Uh, I did not know it was a living book. I did not know it was timeless. I did not know God was the same yesterday, today, and forever. I did not know those things. But I learned it, and I thought, wow, these things are still true and are still happening today. And there's nothing that's new under the sun. But Matthew chapter 5, as we get into the Beatitudes, and uh, we kind of Go down through the Beatitudes. Look, if you would, in verse 10. This is the very last one of the Beatitudes. He says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, if you're persecuted because you're a jerk, you deserve it. <laughs> you deserve all the persecution coming your way. But if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, that's a whole different thing. It says, Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, and look at these three things that we see here about persecution in verse 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. You know what that is? That's saying bad things about you. And then it says, and persecute you. That could be physical persecution, or again, could be verbal persecution. And then it says, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. There we see it again. He's emphasizing people's words. How many times have we ever heard growing up, you know, some kid calls somebody up, some other, uh, maybe call you a name on the playground, like sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. And, you know, we were always taught to say that. But I was, I was always amazed. I thought, even as a child, I thought, that is like the dumbest saying ever. Because it still hurts. Doesn't it? Names still hurt. You know why? Because words are powerful. Very powerful. And don't you think the devil knows it? Oh, yeah. So he's going to send his little missionaries around to try to torment God's people. And two of the three forms of persecution are verbal persecution. And it happens all the time. And it goes on here. It says uh, in verse 11... And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now if they're saying it and it's true, well that's on you. But when it's false and they're just making stuff up, it should be water off a duck's back. Just let it go. Keep on going. I think I told you years ago that a lady I had working in my office. And uh, she did not like me whatsoever. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, I didn't know why. I guess because I tried to help her one time and say, hey... You know, she was answering phones and she was telling people something that was completely wrong. And I was like, you can't be telling people that stuff. We're not allowed to say that. And uh, she was 
It was a government job. She was breaking the rules pretty seriously. And she's like, are you my boss? Are you my supervisor? And I was like, well, no. And she goes, well, then you need to keep your mouth closed. And she kept on talking and saying this stuff. And I was like, okay, you know, whatever. Well, it was like a week or two later, I got promoted to where I was her supervisor. <laughs> so, but she did not like me for anything. And, uh, and then time had gone on, probably maybe six months or so, and I got promoted into another position. I was a manager, and uh, her position was being done with. Well, I hired her into my area, just you know, trying to continue to keep her employed. And uh, so I hired her in my area, and I gave her a job. She was at the front. I didn't know she was going around the whole office, and she was talking trash about me. And she was just running my name through the mud about all, and she was making up story after story. And I had no idea. And I had some people come up to me and like, well, I heard something about you. And I said, really? What is it? And it's like, they started to say something. And it's like, but I knew as soon as I heard that, it wasn't true. I was like, well, you're right. It wasn't true. Because I don't know who's saying it, but they got a bit of an imagination, you know. And then she was saying all this stuff. And one of my uh, former supervisors, who was now, uh, she was now working again in, in my section, uh, she came up and she told me, she goes, I just want you to know who's saying all this stuff. And she told me, and I was like, you know, I was like, she's really the one with the problem. She's one sad, unhappy person. And there's not a thing anybody can do for her. And it's like, until that person gets saved, I mean, I, I've got the joy of the Lord in my heart. I'm going to go on about my life. Everything she says, is going to, it's not going to affect me one bit. And people in the office knew my reputation. They knew who I was, and they knew right off as soon as they heard this stuff. Now, there was another guy in there. He wanted to believe these things to be true because he didn't like me either. And uh, I tried witnessing to him, and he didn't want to have anything to do with it. And uh, so me and, he, he and I butted heads you know, a few times, but he didn't mind listening to what she had to say. But that was it, and it was okay. Sometimes life is that way. But persecution comes in all kinds of forms, but the one that gets us most is the verbal persecution. Turn, if you would, back to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. And I don't tell you these things to make me look like I'm somebody, because I'm just like you. I struggle with this stuff, too. I struggle with things when people say something. Sometimes it hurts my feelings. And I have to do all the, the mental exercises and say, now, wait a minute. Is that true? Uh, it's not true. God knows it's not true. So I'm not going to worry about it. I have to go through and think through all these things myself. So I'm not any different than you are. But Psalm 42, look if you would uh, what it says here in verse 1. Again, the Psalm of David, he says, As the heart, which is a deer, paineth after the water brook, so paineth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? You know what's happening to him right here? He's being persecuted. Where is your God? He's forsaking you. What was David doing before he came to the throne? He was running for his life, wasn't he? He was running for his life from Saul for several years. And then he got a band of men who were following him. And then even at one time, those faithful men who followed him wanted to kill him. And people are coming up and saying, where is that God? Where is that God? And he's like... He's saying, man, my soul is thirsting after you, God. You know I'm longing for you. And here these people are coming up, and they're breaking my heart by saying this. These are people that are near and dear to me, and they're breaking my heart. And look what happens in verse 4. He says, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. He's saying, look, I went to church with these people. These people, we sang praises to God together. We worked together. We served God together. We did all these wonderful things together. And now they're the very ones discouraging me. Verse 5. Why art thou cast down on my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? You know what he's doing right there? He's talking to himself. He's doing these mental exercises you and I need to go through. It's like, look, why, my, why is my soul cast down? Why am I discouraged? The things they're saying is not true. They're saying, where is that God? I know where God is. I know that God, you're on the throne. I know you've got a plan and purpose for what you're allowing in my life. I know these things to be true. Look what he says next. Hope thou in God. For I shall yet 
praise him for the help of his countenance. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites from the hill of Mizar. So here David is saying, look, these verbal persecutions are going to come, and we need to do these mental exercises and say, look, is there any truth in them? If there is, we need to deal with that. If there's no truth, well, hey, God's still my hook. He's still my anchor. He's the anchor of my soul, and my hook's going to rest in him. But we all are going to be persecuted verbally. Now back in Psalm 7, it says here, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. All them, all of his enemies. Who are our three great enemies? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Do you think the world is your friend? No. The world hates Christianity. Christian persecution has increased in these last days drastically. Some couples have been denied foster care because of their faith. I remember when we were asked in foster care, when we did foster care, and we were looking maybe for some other kids that the Lord led that way, uh, we said, well, we're going to take them to church. And, you yeah, know, that's what we're going to do. I mean, if, they're, if, they don't, if they're not a Christian, well, we're going to pray in that direction. We're going to have Bible time. This is what we're going to do. <laughs> I mean, we just laid it out in the line. Some people that don't get foster care because of that. Students have been discouraged and told to keep silence about their beliefs. There was a group of fifth graders that, that were told they could not have a prayer club in their school uh, because it might offend somebody. But they don't have a problem with all this other junk that's offending everybody else, do they? Others are allowed to indoctrinate freely, but not Christians. Those that preach tolerance are intolerant of opposing viewpoints or differing opinions. <laughs> and that's the way it always is. The FBI and IRS have avoided accountability, still yet have been held accountable, they have yet to be held accountable, when they were targeting Christian groups and companies. They were called radical traditionalists. Christians have been labeled, and these same Christians that they were targeting, the FBI, remember that memo that went around? They were targeting, a, a, it was a Catholic group at that time, and then there was other groups they were trying to go after. Here's what was said about them. They are racially or ethnically motivated, violent extremists. Now, how crazy is that? Was that true? No. Falsely accused. There was a pro-lifer in the United Kingdom who was arrested for being in front of an abortion clinic. Now, they have a law there that you're not allowed to hold a sign. You're not allowed to pray audibly. But you can stand on a public sidewalk. There's no law against that. But he was arrested. They asked him. They said, are you a pro-lifer? He said, yes, I am. They said, well, what were you doing here? He said, I was just standing here. They said, were you praying? He said, I was just standing here. But he got arrested because of what they thought he was thinking. How crazy is that? I'm telling you, we do not live in our grandparents' world anymore. And for us to think otherwise is putting our head in the sand. It doesn't work that way. The Lord is ready to return, and we need to be ready for His return. We need to be loving His appearing. How do we do that? Get in God's Word. Get in the fellowship of other believers. If there's any place you ought to be encouraged, it ought to be in God's house. Now, let me say this. Remember where David was when he got discouraged? It was those same people. The devil will try to use good people with good intentions to try to discourage you. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Give people the benefit of the doubt. The far left, the satanic, Islamic extremists, the feminists, the al I call them the alphabet crowd. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I can't remember all the letters. And uh, But they're all full of hate. They're full of hate. Why? Because the things that they thought would make them happy and fulfilled have failed them. And they are the most unhappy people on the planet. And they want everybody else to feel the same way. That is what David, that was his prayer that he was lifting up. He was praying for deliverance from these things. But now, let's go quickly here through these other things. Verse 3 through 5, we see David pleading his case with God. He says, Oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that, that without cause is mine enemy, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Yea, 
let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay my honor in the dust. Selah. David is doing some soul searching here. He's saying, search me, O God. Try me. If I am guilty and I deserve this, then let it all happen. But we don't pray that oftentimes, do we? We don't do the soul searching and say, now, was I ever in the wrong? Have I been faithful to you, God? Or did I drop the ball somewhere? Or is there sin found in me? And Lord, if there is, then I deserve what I did. I've had to do that sometimes when Becky and I would get in an argument. And there would be some, maybe some hurt feelings or something. And I would have to go off by myself and say, now, Lord, am I in the wrong? Where? Please show me. And he says, attitude was wrong. The way you said that was wrong. Okay. And guess what I have to do? I don't go back to her. And she does the same thing. She does it when she comes back to me. But we don't go and start accusing each other of all their wrongs. Even though they were 99% wrong. We take care of that 1%. And we leave the rest up to God. That's the way it's supposed to work. And that's exactly what David's doing here. He says, look, if I've deserved any of this, then Lord, let it happen. Let them pour their wrath upon me. But he realizes that he was innocent because God did not reveal anything to him. Look at verse 6 through 13. This is where David proclaims God's righteousness with the wicked as well as with the righteous. He says, Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Lift up thyself because of the rage of my enemies and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. So David is asking here for God's justice to go forth. In verse 7 it says, So shall the congregation of the people come to thee about for their sakes. Therefore return thou on high. Here he's asking God to exalt himself above what his enemies have done and exalting themselves. Isn't that what the, the wicked people are doing? They're trying to keep trying to one-up everybody else. And they're trying to make sure they can keep you down. But they, they stay exalted. He's saying here, look, I want you to be exalted above anything that they've done. Any wickedness that they've done themselves. I want you to be lifted up on high. Look at verse 8 and 9. Here he's asking God for his judgment to the just and to the wicked. He says, the Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is in me. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and the reins. And that's the thing is God knows the whole picture anyway. He just wants justice to be done. In verse 10, he's telling God, God knows that David's heart is pure. He holds no malice towards his enemies, but he's still desiring justice to be done. Verse 10, he says, My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. Now, could we say the same thing, that our hearts are pure? If they're not, that's what we need to confess. Get it right. And then verse 11, he says a couple things here. He says, God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. Now, that one verse right there could be a whole message, but I'm just going to give you here the nuts and bolts of it. That word judges right there, God judges the righteous. That word has a multitude of meanings. And this is all what God does for his children. Let me give you these definitions here. It means to rule. He rules his children, doesn't he? He tells us what we should do and should not do. It, it also means to govern. Kind of goes along with the same idea. But he's there watching over us to make sure that we have safety and protection. He avenges us. Isn't that wonderful? When our enemies say things against us, God's the one who avenges us. It means to plead. He pleads our case. Remember what Jesus Christ is doing? He's pleading before God the Father. He is our intercessor there for us. He defends us. He delivers us. And he also punishes us. Remember the chastening of the Lord? We're not to faint when we're rebuked of him. Because it's something very precious to God's child. That proves you're his child. It's when we are punished of God. All of these we should be happy to receive. We have to be thankful when we have all these things in our life. And then it says there that he is angry with the wicked every day. That word angry means he is going to defy them. It's like, oh yeah, you think that's what you're going to do? Well, we'll let you do that for a little while, but we're going to, we're going to have our way in the end. He's going to squash them like an ant. But I, I love what it says as we get down to verse number 12 and 13. He says, he says, God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not. 
What's God willing? He wants all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. But if he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared him for the instruments of death. He ordained his arrows against the persecutors. God's judgment is going to fall upon them. But before we ever see God's judgment, we see his mercy and his patience. I'm glad we have a patient, merciful God. And even though we have people who's turning our country upside down, inside out, and doing all kinds of things, we still ought to pray for their salvation. We still ought to pray. Because I tell you what, there's nothing. I remember Manasseh, the king in Israel, 55 years, one of the most wicked kings Israel ever had. He ended up getting saved later on in his years. And I'm sorry, Judah, uh, the tribe of Judah. One of the most wicked kings that got saved later in his years. What a glorious thing that is. How patient God is. How long suffering. But God is always going to accomplish his justice. And then in verses 14 through 16, we see that David predicts their future. Uh, he's talking here about the wicked. He says, Behold, he travaileth with iniquity, and hath conceived mischief, and brought forth falsehood. He's stating here what, what they've done. And then he says, here's where he starts predicting. He made a pit, and digged it, and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pain. All of these things that God is doing and, and David here is replaying all of this stuff in his mind because he's like, look, their clever devices that they're doing, are not, they're not going to be any clever than what God is. They're not going to fool God. God is going to have his way in the end. And I like the way the psalm ends here in verse 17. David praises his Lord above all things else. He says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. You know, we like to praise the Lord when everything's going good, don't we? Mm -hmm. But what about when our enemies start persecuting us? Are we still ready to praise the Lord? Mm -hmm. Remember that song we sang right before I started preaching? It talked a little bit about that. We ought to choose to praise the Lord no matter what happens in our life. No matter what's going to take place. But it says, I will praise the Lord according to His righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord. Most High. What will the words of your song be? Will it be full of complaining and grumbling? Or will it be like David says, Look, Lord, if I've done something wrong, here's what my enemies are doing to me. Here's how they're persecuting me. You know all the details. And if I deserve this, please let me know, and I'm willing to accept it. But if not, Lord, I just want your justice to be served on them as well as on myself. And all your people, I want your justice to be served. And Lord, I'm hoping they turn from their wicked ways. But if they don't, I know what their end's going to be. And no matter what takes place, I'm going to praise you above all things else. I'm going to praise you in spite of what is being said, in spite of what's being done. I'm going to praise you. Not just with my mouth. He's going to praise him with his life. And that's something we all ought to do as well. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your blessings. I pray, Lord, that you will have your way and will now at this invitation time. And, Lord, we are so thankful that, Lord, you do all things well. And, Lord, we don't always respond as we should. So oftentimes when people do say things against us or about us or, or even when they do things to us, Lord, we want to take matters into our own hands. And sometimes we spout off at the mouth ourselves and, and we end up sticking our foot in there and then we say something that we regret and, and we can never retrieve those words. But, Lord, we, what we can do is just confess them and forsake them. And we even need to go to those people and confess those same sins. So, Father, I pray that you help us realize that you are a just and holy God. And, Lord, you're going to be just with the righteous as well as with the wicked. And, Lord, in the end, it's all going to come out. It's going to be as it should be. And, Lord, your people are going to be exalted and the wicked Unfortunately for many of them, because they have chosen that path. And Lord, it's not that you won't save them, it's that they won't choose to be saved. But Lord, they're in the serve. And Lord, I just pray that as many as we can reach before the, that final day comes, when we take our last breath, or they take their last breath, or Lord, even when you call us out of here, that Lord, we can try to reach as many people as possible. Lord, I don't know what the needs are here tonight, but you do. 
And I pray that you'd help us to be encouraged. And Lord, help us to realize that sometimes even amongst your own people, sometimes that's where discouragement can come from. But Lord, it should not sidestep us. It should not lead us astray. We should still continue to be faithful, continue to trust you. And the Lord, just look to you because you are the righteous judge. Father, we ask you to have your way and will this invitation time in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 351, as we sing a few verses, God spoke to you once again. I want to pray for these names and these cards up here as we sing.